not only being ingrained and trained by the industrial age, but then being overwhelmed in the information age. Anybody here receive any egg publications? <laughs> or maybe I should ask how many per day? <laughs> Information's at our fingertips, right? Do you ever get conflicting views on any given topic? That's probably becoming the norm. And of course, as long as we stay with these two here and don't advance beyond that, I think that, is continue, that will continue to be a struggle. And we will continue to have outcomes that we will look back on and wonder, what were we doing? Or what were we thinking? Or more yet, I can imagine my daughter or my grandkids someday asking me, didn't you see this coming? Didn't this happen once before in history and didn't you pay attention? I want to make sure that we're asking the right questions. But more importantly, I want to make sure that we move into a different age, and this is an age of making decisions. Now you see, this whole idea of making decisions comes down to individuals. Okay? It was talked about earlier how a, a farm bill, or how conservation programs, or how uh, organizations can be tools, but they ultimately are not what's going to change the course of things, right? You see, I could talk about the health of soils and plants and animals and, and how it affects humans, but until someone actually gets sick or, or unfortunately dies, lots of people don't pay attention. I could talk about how we probably need to look at relieving our dependence on inputs over time, or maybe even very quickly. But until the farm's about to get foreclosed on, does it strike as many people as it normally would? You see, this industrial model has taught us to do things. But we need to combine that with com thinking about things. Okay? And I think we have to take that on as individuals, and I think that's part of this decision-making age that we can take ownership in. Just as Dave Brandt talked about it, we can take ownership, accountability, and responsibility for what we do. And we can provide our own insurance policies in the making when we do it. So, you know, being a government employee, I was, I was thinking about, okay, how, how can I, and, and of course, I'm, I, my background is in engineering, so everything for me usually starts out kind of black and white with straight lines and everything in order. My wife might tell you that if she looked at my desk at home, that order is probably not the first word that comes to mind. But I wanted something that I could kind of methodically step through a few of these thoughts that I have. And, and mind you, you're going to get a little bit of my opinion. Well, you might get a lot of my opinion, but you're, you're going to hopefully have some food for thought. So I thought, being a government employee, how about I try an acronym? We've got a few of them floating around, don't we? So I thought, well, that should be easy. Beyond our own borders. B O O. I didn't speak yesterday. My name is not Ray Bannister. I can't pull this off. <laughs> okay? Plan B. Let's talk about these borders that we have. And I think there, there's kind of three of them that come to mind. And, and actually, the, the last one kind of developed on a recent trip that I got to take um, with some, some gentlemen, some grazers, uh, that one, when we went down to Florida in mid-December. But this first one, I think, is a personal border. Okay, Beyond our own borders, is it not hard to escape the borders that we put around our own thinking? Okay? And in order to stretch those boundaries, we can't just stretch them to where we want. We actually have to stretch beyond that because there's probably going to be a little bit of retraction when reality comes with it, right? So we have this personal boundary. Then I think we have this management boundary. Most of us consider those where our fence lines are, where our property boundaries end. And then all of a sudden, we have a third one that I think really gets neglected in the ag community. Now, when I say influence, I'm not saying everybody's got to be on TV or on the radio or give presentations, but are you willing to tell your story in the first place? And I'd like to talk about that just a little bit. Now, in this first level, the personal level, this to me is where we start identifying this story that we want to live. Okay? Now, I can, I can probably see on a few of your faces, you know, a few years ago I came to these workshops and we talked about crop rotations and no-till equipment and then we got our boundaries pushed a little bit because we started talking about cover crops and mob grazing and now we got some lunatic up front that's going to talk, talk about the warm and fuzzy stuff. 
I've been all around this country. I've been very fortunate to be able to do that. Even a couple of other countries. And trust me, the warm and fuzzy stuff is the foundation that everything else gets built on. And if it doesn't get built on that, then it doesn't have any direction. It doesn't have scope. In operations, whether it be organic operations in Minnesota, or it be, be cattle operations in Texas, or from coast to coast, when you actually ask people truly, and you keep asking them why they do something, either they get frustrated because they can't answer it, or they finally get back to their beliefs and their values. And I think it's something that I think is important for anybody who shares their story. I don't think it's really a story unless you share those things. For me, everything falls under an umbrella. And my first one is this right here. My faith in God. That directly falls down into family, into health, into care of creation, into providing for others. Now your list may, may be different from this. And that's just fine. I, I would suggest that there's probably at least some similarities with a lot of people. But this is what establishes the integrity of, of my story. And what I encourage people to do is find out what establishes the integrity of your story. And everything gets built from there. Now we know that business and agriculture and, and all of its complexity can be difficult. And I'm not suggesting that it isn't. But I'm suggesting if it has a strong foundation, it has a much better chance of moving forward. And this doesn't matter what your age is, what the stage of career you're in, or even if you haven't decided what your career is exactly going to be yet, this stuff, I think, still applies. Now, a quote that uh, a few of the Canadians in here are, are probably going to recognize, this is from a conference that I attended uh, a while back. He said, if you want to make small changes, change how you do things. Go to a conference, go to a tour, go to a workshop, pick up a tip or a trick, some sort of technique, and then go home and implement it. Those things are helpful. I'm not denying that. But if you want to make big changes, we need to change how we see things. And if we change how we see things, you might be surprised what you actually see. You see, years ago, just like Dave talked about how five years ago, he didn't put any thought into soil health. I guarantee you he probably sees things a little differently now than he did back then. Before I joined the Burley County team, I didn't know anything about soil health. But trust me, it didn't take but a couple hours into my first day that I realized my path was going to be quite different. This is from Don Campbell in uh, um, fairly far north into Canada. So the first thing that I ask people when they when they want to see things differently, I ask them this. I said, what is your definition of a couple different things? First one, a farmer. How about a rancher? Yesterday I wore a cowboy hat at our grazing coalition workshop. Today I didn't wear one. Yesterday, by some people's standards, I would have been a rancher. Today, not so much. But what is our definition of those two things? I'll tell you a short story. When I was in Minnesota teaching a holistic management course, it was a two-day course, it was actually last winter. And in this course, there was probably about 20 different people. And the size of the operations, ag operations there, were anywhere from an acre to 10, maybe 15 acres. And the concepts were all the same. But the whole time, the first day and a half that I was there, I referred to most of those people because they are in vegetable production. I called them gardeners. And at noon on the second day, there's a gentleman who came up to me, and he's got hair probably 10 times as long as me. And he said, Josh, he's like, I have something to tell you. And I said, by all means, what, what's up? And he said, Josh, he said, for the last day and a half, you have called us gardeners. We don't do this just for fun. And we don't do this just to spend money. We are a farmer just like anybody else. He said, we would prefer to be called vegetable farmers. He said, I know in central North Dakota you got big farms and you got big ranches and they're probably getting bigger. He said, but that doesn't make me any less of a farmer than anybody else. The soil is still important to me, the plants, the animals, and how we feed humans is all still the same. So when you look at things that way, I've realized that there's probably more people that we have things in common with 
than we maybe realized to begin with. This last one down here, what's your definition of wealth? Did you notice on my list of, of beliefs and values, where did, where did, where did money or, or income fall on that list? It wasn't even on the list, was it? Now, do I think that money is a tool that we probably need to do some things? Absolutely. But I've also found out that so many of the things that we do, if we focus on the right things, I believe we will be provided for, and that's where the financial part of this comes in. If you ask yourself, what's the meaning of net worth? Is it just assets minus liabilities? I would suggest that it's hopefully more than that. And the reason I say that about financial is it's not because it's not important, it's not because it doesn't need to be a part of the equation, but it needs the appropriate balance in that equation. And what I have found time and time again, a common theme across the United States with those operations that are managed holistically, which has been a common theme throughout today, is that they're good financial managers, but they put it in the appropriate context and they lead with this idea of quality of life, they lead with this idea of resource enhancement, regeneration, and soil health. Now the financial horse is still in that bunch. Now maybe yours is pulling something other than a beer cart, but it's part of the equation, keeping it in proper context is an interesting concept because making a profit actually becomes easier when we're not dependent on so many other things that have to fall our way. You ever feel like you have a day where everything's just working against you? How about a month that's like that or a year that's like that? It's not much fun, okay? I've been through some years like that and it wasn't even a financial issue. Okay, management level two. This is where we actually play out our story. Now, the first one was identifying the story, creating the integrity for the story. Now we're actually going to play this out. Now, how many here have heard of Stephen Covey or, or, or read the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? A few people? Okay. One of the things in that book that he utilizes, one of the tools or, or diagrams, I should say, that he has is he uses this diagram of dependent, independent, and interdependent. And he uses the analogy of the, the growth or maturation process of a person. And of course, not everybody actually goes through all of these steps, but he talks about how a very young child, a baby, is very dependent. Okay? I have a daughter that's a little over 13 months old right now, and although if I could understand what she actually says right now, she'd probably tell you she's pretty independent, and I don't get to sit down a lot anymore, so I would suggest that that's partly right, but food and shelter and care, all of that comes with being dependent. But our goal is hopefully someday she will move to that next level. She will move away from home. She will maybe go to college, maybe get her first job, start making decisions by herself, taking on responsibilities. You get to the independent stage. But Mr. Covey suggests that there's another level. And that level is this interdependence level where we discover that by ourselves we're only capable of so much. So we combine forces, so to speak, with someone else. And that might be a coworker, that might be a spouse, that might be uh, someone that you, that you work with, some of uh, a relative, but you realize that all of a sudden the one plus one equals something more than two type scenario. Well, I'd ask you this. Is there a model out there that displays this interdependence on a daily basis? Where everything works in unison with each other. Now we might not always think it's perfect because it's not by our rules. Doesn't nature function like that? Okay. You see, back in that industrial model, that works well for lots of things if it's closed mechanical systems. Nature is not a closed mechanical system. The best definition I can come up with to this date, and it's still a feeble one, is this complex, dynamic, open web of ever self-organizing relationships that continues and continues and continues. Therefore, that industrial model doesn't necessarily fit real well in there. Now I'd ask you this. Of these three levels, where does most of agriculture fit today? I would suggest that a good portion of it is right at the bottom level. So do we have opportunity? 
Absolutely. Now don't get me wrong, there's some operations that are producing some of their own uh, fuels or some of their uh, own items that they need, whether it be seed or, or fuel or, or some other type of input, but I would suggest that even those have the opportunity to take another step. A step into this interdependence where, according to Walt Davis, you basically skim off the excess energy that nature provides for you but that your sole duty then is to maintain a healthy ecosystem so that the process can continue. And if we do that, I think we can step up to the plate. Doesn't matter where you are in the lineup, we can make a difference. Now, dependent has a few specific things that seem to be tied to it. Input driven, <coughs> recipe driven, okay? We all like recipes, okay? If we're overwhelmed by this uh, information age, don't we want someone to tell us what to do and how to do it sometimes? The only problem with that is if it starts to happen too much, then all of a sudden we can look and say, she told me what to do, he told me how to do it, it didn't work. It's not my fault. This goes back to this ownership in decisions that we can make, but then we also get the benefits and the opportunities from them also. When you start feeling empowered or you start believing in something, I'm not going to try and hold you back because I think that it will carry you a long ways. How about short-term gains that sometimes have to, many times, have to be paid by long-term expenses? Josh, I'd like to do some conservation this year. I'd really like to work on the soil health thing. I think it would be good, but I need to make money this year. See you next year. We don't do the soil health thing in competition with the profit. We're trying to build that profit for it to be sustainable into the future. Okay, if you don't have those two tied together yet, then I would suggest that it's an incomplete uh, arrangement or equation. Look what might happen with some of the native rangeland that Jay talked about earlier. Have we already paid some long-term expenses based on what was happened in the short term many decades ago? We have, but I think we can also um, gain some traction on what we're doing now and determine what we need to do for the future. And then of course the status quo and likely following the herd. Are you willing to be the black sheep in this picture? Even once in a while, are you willing to look the other direction? And many of you in this room, actually, actually I'm probably preaching to the choir, but many of you in this room have done this already. But this is something that, take the black sheep view, the black sheep perspective once in a while. Question things. Continue to question things. The independent part of this equation, everything of their own. Okay? I can remember hearing stories about so-and-so had this piece of equipment or so-and-so had this skill or this talent, so we always utilize them in a relationship like this. I'm very proud of arrangements that get made both from my family standpoint and from a professional standpoint of the people that I get to work with when they form partnerships. And they might even be informal, but the fact that they all play to their strengths, they get together as a team, they put things together so that's the benefit of the whole operation. If you're going to move forward, it might take partnering, partnering with someone else, especially if you're new to the business or want to get started. Limited enterprise diversity, remember the assembly line? Okay, one thing, one thing you do well, there's risk involved. And then efficiency. How often do we hear the word efficiency? It's constant, 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 constant. But I think there's a step before efficiency, and if we rely just on efficiency, we're just gonna make those small changes. Not that efficiency is bad, but it has to fall in the appropriate order. And then opportunity cost. Now the general definition for opportunity cost is paraphrasing, but what, you could, what else you could be doing with that money? Okay, what other opportunity is there for that money? Well, have we ever considered what other opportunity there might be for this certain resource? or this certain resource base, or this chunk of land? How does it affect your neighborhood? How does it affect your community? How does it affect how things are gonna function in the future? You know, we all get bent out of shape when some group or some legislation wants to limit our ability to do something. But what happens when we limit each other's ability to do something at times? Not suggesting there's a right or wrong answer there, but I think we need to ask the question. And finally, the interdependent stage. Collaboration driven, this is where these partnerships really flourish. You take established people in the business willing to assist those that aren't so established, knowing that the community is going to be stronger 
because of all of it together. Okay? In years past, there's decisions that my family could have made that may have been more profitable from a money standpoint. But you know what? We looked at that broader definition of wealth and how we can serve others, help others, still provide for ourselves, but not at the expense of other people. This last summer, we had a really good opportunity to, to listen to some gentlemen talk about how their partnership has evolved, how it helps play to their strengths, and how now all of a sudden it actually does some good things for the land, it improves management, and hopefully in time there's going to be many more benefits that are realized through that particular process. And then there's this whole idea of efficiency. You know what efficiency is? It's speed, and it's rate, and it's doing more with less. Okay? My daughter will be able to accomplish more in her lifetime in less time because of what's available to her. So is that why there's predictions out there that her generation is actually going to have a shorter lifespan than my generation? I don't know. But that's a little bit scary. But the point is, is that if we focus all on efficiency but we don't even have a direction established, how are we going to get there? How are we going to know where to go? We're going to go there fast but how are we going to know where to go? And art and science. Now this is always a, a controversial one, to, to say the least. And I actually heard a comment, a, a quote actually, uh, recently at this uh, convention in Florida. I had a, a rancher tell me that he said, you know Josh, he's like, the more that I realize that I don't know, and he said this is making me more and more humble all the time, just like Jonathan talked about earlier. More and more respect for nature and the natural system that we operate with. He said, in his mind, science has become an important tool that he uses to perform his art as a land manager. And I thought, you know, that falls right in line with the idea that science should help us and inform us to help us make decisions. But because everything is so unique and so complex, it shouldn't dictate what those decisions are. And that's why we have these innovators and early adopters out there that are willing to take some chances. And of course if we function in this manner, this one plus one equals something greater because it's part of this holistic uh, equation, so to speak. This is why so many of the things when we talk about soils, or even when we talk about, talk about profitability at times, the numbers don't always add up. Okay, We can't always get one number that tells the whole story. We would like that, that's human nature, to want that one number that tells us everything. But I would suggest that that's not realistic in most cases. And of course we have to tie this all together. Okay? There's this balance all the way through. There's this balance of people and finances and resources. And through this whole process, it has to be, yes, there has to be some short-term benefit for us to continue to do what we do, but we have to question what we're doing in the first place. Because if we question that, then we might understand how, to the best of our ability anyway, what the long-term effects are going to be. And if we think that way, I think that agriculture no longer is this efficient industrial process that produces commodities. But it's an effective biological process to produce high-quality food. Okay, I'm not sure exactly when agriculture and food started to become disconnected. But I think there is a disconnect. And if you don't believe that, just go to a big city somewhere. Not that it has to be a big city, but start asking people what they think of their food, where they get their food, what they believe about food. And it will inform you. It might scare you. But it should energize you also, because that's where the opportunity to do something about that. So what kind of operation do you run? And I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I'm just asking. Ask yourself, what kind of operation do you run? Do your products reflect what your true beliefs and values are? Based on some of the products on the market today, I question that very thing. Some of the actions that we take, I question where this comes from. Because if we really have these beliefs and values, I think there would be some things that are different. Okay, level three. And I see we got a couple people over here sleeping, so I'll try not to uh, try not to wake them in the process. This becomes about telling our story. 
sorry, you're in the front row, so <clears throat> prime target. Telling our story. This is a picture of one of our workshops from before, previous years. Very valuable, hopefully informative, part of this telling the story process. Okay? We can even have summer tours, and we have many of them. Okay? I think they're very good things. Heck, we even get people out in the middle of the winter. Okay? Winter grazing tours, winter soil health tours. Believe it or not, we can work on soil health during the coldest, darkest months that we have. Sometimes that might be our biggest opportunity. But you see, I don't think it can stop here. We have to go to where the food is bought. We have to go to where the people are making decisions. We have to go where businesses are being started based on food. And are we connected to those people? Back in that dependent stage, if tomorrow all of your access was gone to produce the inputs that you normally use. Now I'm not saying that you would just have to pay more for them or that if you pay more before the next guy you'll just get more of them than he or she will. I'm talking about you just don't even have access to them. What would you do? Could you continue? Could you look at all of those biological processes and all of those relationships that someone like Jonathan talked about this morning and could you put things together to where it would still function? And better yet, if the products that you produce, if you had to sell them directly to the consumer, would you be able to sell them? And what would you sell them under? What would you tell them about that particular product? Because see, people, millions and billions of people all over the world are making decisions each and every day about the food that we eat. And I don't believe that we can continue to take the approach that we produce food for the world, leave us alone, let us do what we do. There will be more that's demanded of us, but if we take a proactive approach to that, we can be a part of how we're going to write those rules and how we're going to be a part of something that can be really, really good. Now a couple of the guys that, uh, I guess Daryl and Ken, and, and probably Jerry as well, when we were down in Florida, uh, one night at the bar, believe it or not, we did go there one night, we ran into a couple of, of ladies that were there that seemed to avoid us for some reason. Now, maybe it's the fact that Daryl's six foot seven, he was wearing his boots and a cowboy hat, that they were a little intimidated, but they just seemed to avoid us for some reason. But as we were able to engage in some conversation, we found out why. You see, earlier that day, in this hotel, which is a pretty big place, Okay, we stayed on, or at least I stayed on the ninth floor, and this gal supposedly stayed on the ninth or tenth floor, but she got on the elevator. All three of these gals got on the elevator earlier that day, and in that elevator was a gentleman with a cowboy hat on. It wasn't Daryl, in this case. And she asked him, are you here for the cowboy convention? And he sneered at her, evidently, I wasn't there, but how she told it is he kind of sneered at her and he said, no, we're here for the National Grazing Convention and he refused to talk to her the rest of the nine floors on the way down. You wanna talk about missed opportunity? Later that night, we spent time talking to these three individuals, telling them what we do, telling them how we do it, but most importantly, we told them why we do it. And for the most part, I don't think they necessarily connected until we started talking about the why. Then all of a sudden, the how and the what started to make some sense. There was believability. So my question for you is, do you have an elevator speech? How long does it take to get from floor 10 to floor one? Seconds, right? How good a salesman are you? How interesting are you? How much are you willing to tell in nine floors? Do you have an airplane speech? Now most of the time when I get on an airplane and I'm by myself and I sit down next to someone and they say, how are you? And I say, fine and I try and repeat the courtesy to them, and that's probably the end of it. But yet I hear of people time after time after time that engage in conversations that was not only beneficial for the person they were talking to, but beneficial for them. So do you have an airplane speech? Are you willing to listen? Some of you, maybe the bar is a better one, okay? Maybe a couple drinks and the conversation gets that much better. Or maybe you just open up at that point. But are you telling that story? Maybe the coffee shop is a better place. 
Maybe it's a little calmer. Maybe that's just your drink of choice. But telling that story becomes ultimately important. And if you're not telling that story, why? Now, if you're like me and you're fairly introverted and, and kind of shy, then maybe that's what holds you back. But if you're not telling your story because you're afraid and <laughs> shy and bashful and Chip's pointing at his wife, Ann Fisher, anybody who knows Ann Fisher knows that that would be the opposite. But as you go through this, and if you're not telling your story, is it because you're afraid to tell that story? And I've often heard that people say, well, I don't want to tell the story because I'm afraid they're going to take my story and they're going to run with it and they're going to twist it and they're not going to tell it the way I told it. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? They're already telling your story. They're going to tell it whether you talk to them or not, so you might as well take a shot at it. Is that not what happened down in Florida? We have people that have an opinion, and I believe we changed some opinions while we were there. And we didn't try and fight with these people. We wanted to have a rational discussion. And when you start talking about beliefs and values, I think that's where some of these things can start. Now, Simon Sinek, he's part of this think tank, uh, works with the RAND Corporation, uh, works on a number of different things from a planning and strategy standpoint with the military. But he talks about uh, or codified this process uh, called the Golden Circle. And just real briefly, he talks about everybody knows what they do. Pretty much everybody knows what they do and they can tell you what they do. Many of those people can tell you how they do it. Very few people can tell you why they do it. And he said the great thinkers and the people that are ultimately successful, not because of market conditions or because of some opportunity or some great invention or financial support, but the people who rise up from nothing and achieve their goals, make decisions from the inside out. Most of society tries to make decisions from the outside in. Okay, the most clear thing is the what. The most gray area and blurred thing is the why. And if you go from the outside in, you tend to just kind of avoid that middle part and hope things work. Okay, it's kind of like the idea that if we just get all these pieces and we separate them all out in nature and we get every one of those parts to, to, to optimize or maximize, well then the whole must come out just right, right? Time and time again, we're proved wrong by that process. In today, I think agriculture has become divided. Right, wrong, or otherwise, I believe it has become divided. And excuse the, maybe some of the terminology that I use, but I think you will get the gist of it. Okay, it's not to throw anybody under the bus or, or support any other one or anything like that. But if you look at this process, would you agree that there's a def or, a, or, or a separation that's occurred over time? Now, some people may not believe so, but I think there's at least some difference. But here's the thing. Each one probably offers some things. Each one also has some things to work on. And I'm not suggesting that this is a perfect one, but we heard about one earlier today. Actually, the theme throughout the day highlights one that I think makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to steal the term from Paul Brown, and I didn't actually ask him for permission, so I hope it's all right. But this biological system that is based on interdependence, holistic natured, with goals, values, and beliefs leading the way, I think offers direction for all of us. And in that process, we don't have to label ourselves with certain tools or certain processes or certain organizations. Because you see, agriculture can continue to divide and that's only going to weaken what we were truly after in the first place and that's providing food for the world. Do we need to continue to do that and do we need to find better ways? Absolutely. How we do those things is what generally divides groups or people. But if we start from the foundation, I've seen, I've seen groups come together. I've seen grazers and wildlife groups be on opposite ends of the room. And later, they're intermixed and you wouldn't be able to tell one from the other. I've seen crop farmers and ranchers be on opposite ends of the room at times. And something such as cover crops or grazing and nutrient cycling has brought groups like that together. We need to find what brings this entire group together and run with it. Because this common denominator, I still rings true to the same thing. Now it doesn't matter if it's wildlife or if it's livestock, crops, native vegetation that we talked about earlier, 
but it all comes down to the same common denominator, and that's healthy soils. And if we have those healthy soils, do you know what else we get? We can get so many other things, these things included, and much, much more. You know, the whole idea that if we solve a problem, all the symptoms go away, we need to start looking at it from that particular approach. Here's a book, and I haven't actually made it all the way through this book, but it was kind of intriguing to me because we all have heard of the health concerns throughout the country and, and obesity and, and all of the things, cancer and heart disease and diabetes and, and everything that goes along with that. And of course, when you truly look at all of this, it comes back to a nutritional source, okay? Not from a quantity standpoint, okay? You guys all know that if you take, if you take 10 bales of straw and you feed it to cows, that's one thing. But you might be able to accomplish the same thing or better with one or two good bales of alfalfa, right? Okay, put that into a human context. More and more of the same that's not working doesn't necessarily help you. Okay, that's where this nutrient density thing comes in. And this mindless eating process has created this mentality that we'll just eat whatever's offered to us or if it's on the shelf must be good. Now I told you I wasn't going to really focus on the eating, but my point with this one is, is there times, and I'm guilty of this too, but is there times where our farming and ranching has become at least a little bit mindless? In how we approach it, how we think about things, and how we make these decisions. And I would suggest that if we move up from that dependent to independent to interdependent, we can have something a little more this style. Okay, this book right here, Born Again Dirt. I was always told, don't ever call it dirt, Josh, it's soils. Well, in my mind, it depends on how degraded it is. If it doesn't have any life, then it might be dirt. But we have the power to rebrand the process that we use and have Born Again Dirt. So I'm going to leave you with a few questions. Not that I'm even going to try and answer these. But what if agricultural operations made decisions based on a holistic contest, context that balanced people, land, and money? What if landowners and managers combined land bases and management to bring more opportunity to the whole community? A little bit different than some of the cutthroat type approach that we all know is out there. What if we allowed the predator-prey relationships to function at all levels? What if we trusted nature to do most of the work according to her rules? What if all of our products came with a story of purpose and integrity? You see, if our products are good enough to go national and international, our story should be good enough to go with it. And you can't convince me that that's not possible with the things and the tools that we have today. And lastly, what if we all thought beyond our own borders? Change almost never fails because it's too early. It almost always fails because it's too late. By the time you realize that your corner of the world is ready for innovation, it's almost certainly too late and it's definitely not too early. There may be a small price to pay for being too early, but there is a huge penalty for being too late. What's your story? And more importantly, when you get close to the end of your story, how do you want to feel about it? Thank you.